hello, and welcome once again to a weekly Beatles program that we call Things We Said Today. This is a show that centers on what's going on in the world of the Beatles newswise. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the co-hosts of the show, and you know me best for a program that I host called Every Little Thing, a syndicated Beatles show. And I'm being joined by my co-host, Mr. Beatles Examiner himself, that being Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Uh, hello, everyone. On today's show, we have another special guest to welcome us on the phone. And uh, as you well know, um, this is a time when, my goodness, we've got so many Beatle books coming out all at the same time. In part, I think, because of the Christmas market, but also because of the 50th anniversary of uh, the Beatles' arrival in America. So many things happening, and we have yet but another author on the phone with us, and that is someone who's been a friend of mine for a long time. He's been a part of my radio programs on the Beatles since back in the 80s when I was on WDHA. He is the, um, I guess, senior editor is the title. Am I correct for a Beatle fan? Uh, ex- executive editor. Executive editor, okay. That Al- title and 250 will get you on the subway. <laughs> <laughs> Al Sussman is with us. Hello, Al. Welcome to Things We Said Today. Gentlemen, how are you tonight? We're doing great. Okay. We're close enough to tonight. We can say tonight. Okay. Right. Well, as someone who's always enjoyed Al's articles through the years in Beatle Fan, I'm just so pleased that he has his very first book out. And it's actually called Change in Times, 101 Days That Shaped a Generation. And um, what I want to start this conversation off is to ask Al, why decide to cover this particular period, which is from the day that President Kennedy was assassinated to March the 1st of 1964, 101 days, as you say in the title. Why did you want to cover this particular period? I've always felt that um, November 22nd, 1963, the day of the assassination of President Kennedy, is a, um, is a generational demarcation mark for the, you know, the baby boom generation much in the way that uh, December 7, 1941, Pearl, uh, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor was for our parents, and the way September 11, 2001 is for boomer, you know, the, the kids, the children of boomers and, and other succeeding generations. But I've also always felt that you have to uh, kind of widen that demarcation line to take in the impact of the Beatles in those first weeks of 1964. So when I th- thought of doing this book, I thought, well, how far do I widen that demarcation line? 60 days won't do it because that only takes it to late January. 90 days would put it right in the middle of the Beatles' first visit here. And I thought 100 days would take it to March 1st. And then I realized uh, that 1964 was a leap year. So it would actually be 101 days. And since I considered this to be a textbook uh, example of a period of change, I figured, okay, we'll make it. In fact, the original title was Change in Times 101. Uh, but then we decided not to have 100 and, you know, the, the 101 twice in the title. It was kind of redundant, and so that's why I uh, just put it in the, uh, in the subtitle. Mm-hmm. But, it's, but really, besides the, the assassination of President Kennedy and the impact of the Beatles, there was all this other stuff that happened during those 101 days that either directly led to change, like the Surgeon General's report on smoking, mm. uh, like the passage of the Civil Rights Bill in the House and its movement over to the Senate, as the period is ending, uh, like, uh, you know, a number, a number of other things. And so that's why I considered it sort of a, a textbook example of a period of change. What was interesting to me, Al, was how much history, I mean, the book is really a history book, more than a book mm-hmm. about the Beatles. And, and you know, it, it, some people might find that, you know, might uh, say, well, okay, but it really, I mean, there's a lot of background as to what the world was going through at the time. And, and reading through the book, I mean, I really got a lot of nostalgia. It really 
brought back a lot of memories because although I don't remember everything <laughs> back then, I do. I mean, there were a lot of things going on, and I was. I mean, I was a little young then anyway, but. I mean, there were, um, you really capture a, a, a great detail of the situation that was going on. How did you, how, what did you do? I mean, I, obviously you did a lot of research, but how did you formate that nar- narrative? I mean, that was just very detailed. Well, uh, I spent, before I wrote Word 1, I spent about seven months in the uh, basement of a, uh, of a library in uh, uh, Hackensack, New Jersey, researching, going through microfiche of the New York Times for every day during the period and making copious notes, and then used also Time Magazine, whose archive now is available online uh, as a secondary source. Uh, But uh, just from the Times, you know, going through the Times for every day, I was able to uh, remember a lot of what what was happening. And so I decided instead of saying, this happened on November 22nd, and this happened on December 15th, and this happened on February 1st, to basically split it up into themes. Right. So the, uh, the first two chapters are on the assassination of President Kennedy and its aftermath. Then got chapters on what was happening in the world, what was happening in this country, what was uh, a, a chapter on, you know, specifically relating to change of one form or another. Uh, sports, Broadway, books, TV, uh, movies, pop music, and then the last chapter is, of course, the Beatles. Mm-hmm. Was, was all your research, was this a revelation for you? Were you aware of so much change apart a from... A lot of it, uh, well, yeah, in a, in a sense. Now, a lot of it I did remember. Because I did remember, for instance, the Surgeon General's report. I did remember the Civil Rights Bill passing the House. Uh, I remembered some other, you know, some other specific things. But then, when I did the research, I, you know, discovered that there was a lot more than uh, than I had even remembered. You know, for instance, that was the that was the beginning of the the big money era in sports because the first really big money um, television contract uh, was awarded to um, w- by the National Football League to CBS TV. And that was the beginning of the whole road to, you know, the, 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 you know, the mega big money contracts and also the, the road to prime time telecasts of, of uh, National Football League games. So that you know that kind of thing, you know there was a uh, you know there there were a lot uh, there was a lot kind of bubbling under the surface that you know that at that time it didn't really appear that it signified change, but it did over the course of time. Can I ask how old you are, Al? I was I turned sixty four in August. Okay, well you're two years you're two years ahead of me because I'm six, I just turned sixty two. Oh, I didn't realize you're uh, you're that. Uh, oh yes, oh yes, <laughs> that old. I, I I am, I am. Well, from uh, from now on, Ken, whenever Ken's the baby of the group. Yeah. Yes, Ken is absolutely the baby. Yeah, of the group. I'm the George in the group. <laughs> <laughs> so from now on, now whenever I play any interview of you on the air, I'm going to have this music bed underneath of when I'm 64. When I'm 64, at least for <laughs> another uh, what another eight months. Yeah. <laughs> Just curious, Al, because I know that you've told me for the past couple of years that you were working on this book, and I always wanted to know when it was coming out. It just so happens that it's being released at the same time as the 50th anniversary of the Kennedy oh, assassination. Yeah. Was that, that was, was that the purpose all along? I mean, was it the goal? Well, that was my uh, actually. I mean, the the book itself. I mean, counting all the research, it took it took six years to do. But then, about I guess about oh, I don't know, a year and a half ago. I suddenly realized, you know what? If I time this out just right, I can have this out for the 50th anniversary of the period. Mm. And so, and we were able to, um, you know, to get it just about just about perfect because it um, it actually reached, um, you know, the, the first 
first orders uh, went out uh, early last week. Right. So it was Yay. Exactly, yeah. So it was Yay. almost exactly right on right on the money. I did want to you know separate it a little bit from the you know the whole barrage of the you know the major Beatles books. You know the Mark Lewison book, the Kevin Howlett book, hmm. etc. Uh, so I wanted to separate it a little bit, but uh, but still get it out for at least before November 22nd. Hmm. Well, one of the things that I really like about this book is that it, it paints a very vivid picture of what it was like after the Kennedy assassination. And um, one of the things that you had brought up was that it kind of was the beginning of uh, the end of the innocence kind of a yeah. thing. And there was a cynicism that crept into America and, and not trusting our government. And a lot of that really began with, with the assassination. Yeah. Oh, very much so. Very much because I, um, um, I, when I set the scene at the beginning of the first chapter, I talked about how, you know, when we left for school and for work that Friday morning in November, uh, that we were, this was at a time when we really believed in in our government and in all the government agencies. In fact, when that afternoon, when the first uh, when a, you know, a, a fellow from one of the other classes knocked on our classroom door to tell us that a parent had called up to say that President Kennedy had been shot, I thought, first of all, I thought it was a prank, and but also I figured, well, you know, if. Uh, if somebody had been able to, you know, penetrate the what I figured was an impenetrable wall that the Secret Service would have had around uh, the president, it probably couldn't have been anything too serious. Totally not taking into account the possibility uh, of somebody, you know, in a the upper floor of a uh, of a building with a high-powered rifle uh, being able to. Um, accomplish um you know what he wanted to mm. uh but at that time we really believed in all of the government uh agencies and that really was the beginning of kind of the unraveling of that and of course especially with the way you know the way the vietnam war played out and various other things various other revelations about the cia about the fbi then watergate in the 70s and all um, and Iran Contra in the 80s. Mm. Um, you know, we're to the point now where we <laughs> hardly trust the government to do anything, and you know, not even run a, <laughs> not even run a website. Well, <laughs> right, right, yeah. It's it's really gotten it's really gotten crazy now. Uh, yeah. you know, politically divided. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's ridiculous. And plus, we you know we don't really believe in. In, in our government at all, right? And it's a shame. I kn- I know you. In the article I wrote last week, you you know you said that the Kennedy assassination wasn't linked to, at all to the Beatles, you know right. the the Beatles uh, arrival. But what did what was it that made um, America so ready for the Beatles beyond the fact that they were? I, I mean. There's no question that that they were great on their own. Uh, I mean, they would have very likely made it anyway because of who oh, yeah. they were, what they because of the way they were sold, because mm-hmm. of the music. But what else? What other factors were involved that you saw that, at that time? Well, the uh, as far as I'm concerned, it was going to happen whether or not uh, President Kennedy had been assassinated. Even if he hadn't been, in fact, it might have happened. To, you know, things might have you know, progressed of even a few weeks earlier, it might not have been quite the explosion that it was in early in early January. Mm-hmm. But it, but it, I think they still would have, you know, because the, the the wheels were in motion, and what I called the fuse of the dynamite had already been lit because there had been, you know, the, uh, especially all the scenes of uh, fan hysteria in London for the Sunday night at the London Palladium and for the Beatles' appearance in the Royal Variety Show, which got the attention of the Fleet Street Street London um, papers. Uh, It also got the attention of the London bureaus of the American media, uh, 
And so even before President Kennedy went to Texas, there had been pieces uh, in Time and Newsweek, a piece on the NBC Nightly News, uh, and on the morning of November 22nd, the Alexander Kendrick Report, uh, which ran on the, uh, the CBS Morning News. And, um, you know, and then it finally ran on December, on December 10th. But, uh, you know, as far as the, you know, the reason, you know, the reasons why, um, you know, other than the, you know, the, the, the myth that was created by the, you know, the American, you know, general assignment media that it was because, um, because teenagers were so uh, distraught and heartbroken uh, by the assassination that they needed something to laugh at, which is patent nonsense. Mm. Uh, but I, I think the reasons why are simply, you know, there's basically two. Uh, one is there this very new music and, and also the force of their personalities, the fact that they had, you know, you had four very unique, personalities and in fact they're really the other than the who of course didn't really make much of an impression here until about three years later uh there really was no other british group that had or even an american group in fact that had unique personalities throughout the entire group in fact i remember i, I was very surprised by this that very early on a lot of girls really were very much taken with George Harrison. And I, you know, as a, you know, from a male standpoint, I couldn't really understand that because he was, he was, you know, he was obviously the youngest member of the group. He was skinny, gaunt, uh, you know, a little on the pasty face side. But for some reason, there were a lot of girls that really were very into him right away. And it, so it seemed that there was almost, um, a, you know, a following for each member of the group right away. I mean, on the first trip here, Ringo was the most popular member of the group. I remember how much Ringo was was um, very much uh, very popular back mm-hmm. then. And it was really kind of funny because, you know, Ringo was the was the one that really kind of got got the the joking in the media if you want to call it that because of the rings because of his nose but still he was very he was extremely popular you're, you're exactly right and yeah, um, in fact actually uh, you know because of the you know the american you know the, the general assignment reporters because there was no music media here at that point aside from you know the music industry magazines uh, you know they were really covered for the most part by general assignment reporters who were all middle aged Mm-hmm. and virtually all male. And so to them, you know, of these four guys, there were three that all looked the same with these uh, with these dopey haircuts and the and the only one that that see, the looked different at all was the the short one with the big nose and the hound dog face uh and the funny name. Mm-hmm. And so Ringo got a little bit more attention, but also there was the fact that the that the you know that the girls really latched onto him very quickly. So, so really, you've got four very unique followings going there. Plus, of course, this this music that was so different and so new mm-hmm. uh, in comparison to um, you know not that not that what was being produced in America was at all bad at that point, but it still was very different from what was being from what one could hear on the radio say in the fall of 1963 right well al you and i have talked about this for many years how different Mm -hmm. the beatles were in the sense that you did have four unique personalities there as as compared to a lot of groups where you just had mainly one spokesperson and that person wasn't all that interesting (laughs) and with the beatles each one of them had their own unique personalities and they were fascinating from in that regard. And uh, when we talked to Kevin Howlett, you have to realize in 1963 when the Beatles were getting all this uh, intense exposure on BBC Radio, their fans got to hear these four personalities and how different each one was. And that was part of the fascination as well as the music. 
yes, very much so. And that's, that's why it was only with the American media, it was only the people like Larry Kane down in, in Miami who, um, uh, you know, actually took the time to, and, let, and Ed Rudy also, who took the time to actually interview them and found that, you know, that, for instance, John Lennon was worth the price of admission just by himself, you know, and that Paul was very, was also, you know, very charming and very uh, friendly and, and, and interesting. And George had this very uh, kind of puckish sense of humor, you know, already, uh, you know, at, at, at a very early stage. And, and Ringo was kind of like every man, and he, would, he was great with, you know, coming, and he still is, uh, coming out with one-liners that, you know, that seemed to, you know, to be very appropriate. So you really got four very different personalities, whereas, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right, Ken, that most of the other groups, it was, you know, basically, you know, I mean, the, the Dave Clark Five, as popular as they were, basically none of them had any real personality. <laughs> and same with, uh, same with the Rolling Stones. And Jerry Marsden was, you know, was very nice and all, but he didn't really have that much of a, he wasn't really all that interesting as a personality. Certainly not, you know, not as, as interesting as, as, <laughs> as John Lennon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and not only were the Beatles four interesting personalities, but the way they bounced off each other yes. just made them even more fascinating. Yeah. Right, exactly. So it wasn't, you know, like one, just one individual and three pieces of cardboard, mm. which is, you know, I always think of Jerry and the Pacemakers. Right. Because, you know, really it was just Jerry and then the three, the other three, including Jerry's own brother, you know, may as well have been, you know, cardboard cutouts. Mm. They were absolutely invisible. Mm-hmm. There were instances, um, Chad and Jeremy was one, where they, you know, with with the uh, the acting on say on Batman and Dick Van Dyke, where they tried to put personalities, even though they were fictional, on them. Mm-hmm. But I can't think of another group until we get to the Monkees that did the same thing. You you mentioned the Who, but even the Who didn't do it as much as the Monkees did, right? Um, yeah. I mean, it took I mean, and plus also John Entwistle's personality was not nearly as pronounced as the other three. Right. Right. Um, but also, I mean, they didn't really, they didn't really take off here until '67. Mm-hmm. So um, you know, so you're, you know, you're really talking quite a bit later. But uh, but yeah, I mean, most of the other British acts, um, you know, now obviously in Chad and Jeremy's case, they had a little bit of an advantage because of the fact that they both had acting experience. I mean. You know, Jeremy Clyde went, if I recall correctly, I think he went to the the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts. Mm-hmm. And you know, so you know, so they obviously they you know they were a little bit more uh, of a presence, say on you know on TV. But um, but the you know most of the other groups, I mean, you know, even you know even the even the Stones, like I said, I mean personally, they just had no personalities, and then on stage, basically it was just, you know, Mick dancing around, and, um, and that was about it, at least at first. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you could probably make a put a vote in for Peter and Gordon, too, because, you know, Peter Asher with the glasses and, and Gordon Waller with, you know, the tall, dark, handsome guy. And Yeah, except that, again, you know, they didn't really have very much to say. Right, mm. you know, right. They, they did. No, you're right. They didn't. Uh, but really, it really, I can't think of anybody that grabbed that formula until the monkeys. And and uh, I mean, they did it. You know, they did it very purposely. I mean, there's no question. Right, obviously, it was, you know, the, because they were you know <laughs> made to order. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How did how did ra- how did you see radio uh, compare radio from then to now in terms of what they were doing to to uh, well, radio, especially in the case of the Beatles, mm-hmm. uh, radio was a crucial factor.
because Top 40 Radio, uh, when I want to hold your hand, well, of course, you know, the classic story about uh, Marsha Albert uh, mm-hmm. seeing the Alexander Kendrick Report um, on the CBS Evening News when it finally aired on December 10th, then writing to her favorite nighttime DJ, Carol James, at WWDC in Washington, and then he got, got a hold of a copy of I Want to Hold Your Hand, had Marsha come up to the studio on, I think it was December 17th, introduced the record, and like in some, you know, bad Hollywood, um, you know, movie, the, 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 you know, station switchboard lit up like a Christmas tree, Mm-hmm. And and then he made dubs of the song and sent it to friends of his at other radio stations. And like a prairie fire, this record suddenly took off. And, right. Uh, and especially especially in New York. Uh, right. Oh yeah. I I I lived in New York for a while, and I mm-hmm. I lived in New York in the '60s for a while, and I can vouch for the craziness. Uh, oh, of the absolutely. Beatles on on uh, on the air in in New York, it was it was pretty amazing. Absolutely, because uh, Scott Muni, who was the primetime uh, DJ on WABC at that time, uh, and later became one of the pioneers of FM progressive uh, rock radio, um, he was like their first real champion uh, on New York radio because he immediately saw. Um, you know the quality of their music, and in fact, he um, he was the the front man for the station setting up a Beatles fan club before the um, the actual the official fan club actually even got to um, uh, got to America to set up a uh, an American chapter. Mm-hmm. Uh, cousin Br- cousin Brucey did a lot too. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. The only difference was that Brucey was on. At that point, Brucey was on later in the evening, mm-hmm. um, and in fact, unfortunately, he's the only the only one left of the um, right. the, the prime time DJs that were in New York at that time. Yeah, there was a there was a, a great interview that he and Dan Ingram did mm-hmm. with the Beatles live on on the radio that uh, I happened to be hearing. I happened to be listening that night when it was on. Uh, me, wow, me too. were you really? Yes, I absolutely was. That was when they were staying at the at the Delmonico Hotel. No, 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 no. It was the Warwick, sir. It was the Warwick because oh, I, I, I oh, I know the one the uh, when they All American. Them. Yes, the Order of the All Americans. Yes, right. I heard right. that too. <laughs> yeah, I did too. In fact, I had I had my reel to reel running at the time, and they were playing words words of love, and they cut mm-hmm. it off in the middle and. All of a sudden, cousin Brucey comes in and says, "We're at the Warwick Hotel with the Beatles," and my jaw just dropped. It was like, "Oh my God!" Mm-hmm. And I'm taping it. Yeah. <laughs> of course, you can you can find that interview online now. But oh, boy, yeah. it, it was fun to yeah. hear back then. Yeah, well, I didn't hear those interviews as they were happening, but I sure heard the music. Mm-hmm. I was a big ABC fan from being a little kid. I was four years old when all this was happening, but uh, you know, I certainly remember hearing the music constantly and buying all the records. And they were breaking, and they would break in, uh, you know, when the Beatles were in town, WABC would break in live and, and, um, and do on the spot reports. Uh, some of that stuff has is, is been circulating now, you can hear it, but it's just great to hear the, uh, the street reports from, and you can hear the screaming and everything, and, oh, it's just, it's fantastic. Oh, yeah. I mean, that is, it's the kind of thing that, you know, is inconceivable to think of now. Mm-hmm. That there would be thousands, literally thousands of kids, probably 85, 90% of them girls, mm-hmm. um, basically holding a vigil outside, you know, whatever hotel they were staying at. Right. Um, and the area around that hotel would be absolutely paralyzed. Right. And so I can remember, like, you know, th- you know 30 years later, when, uh, you know, there'd be like a couple of, uh, you know, maybe a couple of hundred kids out in front of the, uh, the MTV studios when, you know, say, NSYNC appeared on uh, TRL, <laughs> and you'd have uh, people saying, oh, it's just like the Beatles. No. And I would think, uh, no, if it was just like the Beatles, that area in Times Square where the MTV studios, I think, still are, uh, would be 
absolutely, par- Times Square would have been paralyzed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's and it, and especially if, you know for people who didn't live through that era, it's tough to explain right. just how huge they were. Right. You know right. how massive their popularity. was. Alan, one of the things that I liked in your book, there's a chapter all about pop music before the Beatles. Yes. And I'm always defending, because I'm not one of those people who will say that before the Beatles, music was boring. You know, I think Mm -hmm. if you lived at that time and you listened to the records that were played on the radio, on Top 40 Radio, you liked the music because that's what represented what was going out at that time. You, You can't look at everything in hindsight and say, well... It was going to be so much more exciting in 1964. That's what you had back then. And you pointed out so much great music that came out the few years before uh, 1964. So you really can't say that part of the Beatles' success was due to the fact that that the music was not as as interesting. Because as far as I'm concerned, and I'm just going to mention a few artists here, Mm because you really go into detail thoroughly about it. And I really enjoyed that. But just as a little kid growing up, I always liked hearing the Beach Boys. I loved the Four Seasons. I played their music constantly before I even heard of the Beatles. Um, I, you know, folk music was starting to become more popular from the Kingston Trio on to Bob Dylan, Joan Baez. Peter, Paul, and Mary was very big in my family. Mm-hmm. All that stuff. Uh, the beginning of Motown. A lot of exciting things were happening in the early 60s before the Beatles. Very much so, yeah. I, I, what, again, this is one of these myths that grow up over time, is that when, um, in the, at the end of the 60s, when, um, uh, you know, when Rolling Stone had, um, you know, had, had been born, and there was now a rock press, and they started to look back and realize that there was, that rock and roll act, actually had a history, um, some retrospectives began to come out and this myth began to grow that the period from, you know, take your pick, either from when Elvis went into the Army or the plane crash that killed Buddy Holly, mm. from there until I Want to Hold Your Hand was this, was this vast wasteland of nothing but, you know, teen idols and dance records and novelty songs. I've even heard Billy Joel say something to, to that effect that it was all yeah. it was all Frankie Avalon and Bobby Rydell, and it, that yeah, was just a small part of it all. Oh yeah, I mean I'll give you 1959 and 60 because there, in, in those two years there was a lot of uh, there were a lot of teen idols and there was a lot of uh, there were a lot of novelty records and there were a lot of uh, you know dance type songs, but from about 1961 on. The, the, you know the uh, the music became it was very rich and very new. It was indeed developing, and new genres were developing during '61 and '62, and particularly '63. '63 was actually a very, uh, very, very rich year musically. Hmm. And a lot of people don't realize that for for those of us that put that music down that early '60s period. The Beatles were covering music from that period, so they obviously loved a lot of that music. Oh, right. absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, it's funny because just, just very recently, um, uh, Steve uh, had a review of a Supremes album mm-hmm. that came out in uh, November of 64 called uh, A Bit of Liverpool. And on that album, they cover a couple of... Motown songs that the Beatles covered, um, I think both of them on, if I remember correctly, on uh, both of them on, are on with the Beatles. Uh, right. They loved, they absolutely loved Motown. I mean, they kept, right. I, I remember in the, uh, the, some of the first interviews they would give when they came to America, they kept mentioning Marvin Gaye. Yep. And they kept mentioning Chuck Jackson, mm-hmm. along with Buddy Holly and Elvis and all. So they uh, they were very much into you know not only Motown but also that whole kind of like uptown R and B that had become very popular in sixty two and sixty three. Also, right. all, all the girl groups that they loved so much of the oh, Beatles, yeah. not just what they covered, a lot of their own original songs were influenced by girl groups. 
Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah, they were they were very much and 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 another thing about the music back then that you would that I think people overlook is, is there was a lot of great rhythm and blues that was going on that mm-hmm. a lot of audiences weren't paying attention to, and that was one of the great things about the Beatles because they they made people pay attention to that. Oh yeah. No yeah, there were some fantastic, and, and and some of the even uh, I've become really obsessed with some of the obscure rhythm and blues stuff from back in that period. And there's just some wonderful music that that uh, really didn't get enough attention back then. Yeah, mm-hmm. and don't forget all the the great Brilla building writers. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, no question. So no question. And well, I mean, they you know the. Um, I think Paul has talked uh, even in recent years about that, that, you know, that originally he and John wanted to be, they wanted to be the new Goffin and King. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's funny because I think at that point they weren't even aware that King was a woman. <laughs> right. Mm. Right. You know, I think they thought that they were both, you know, they were, you know, two men. They, I think they, they weren't aware that uh, most of those Brill Building writers, at least the writing teams, were either like husband and wife teams or you know boyfriend girlfriend whatever but it's interesting that they did look at the songwriting credits on records so they'd be aware of the names goffin and king or lieber and stoller and they they taught us to do the same they taught us to a check the b sides Mm -hmm. of, of records and b check the songwriting credits that's how A World Without Love suddenly took off, because people, you know, kids suddenly started, you know, with the words started to get around school. Hey, you know who wrote that song? That's, you know, John and Paul from the Beatles. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, and, um, and then they also taught us, you know, because obviously, you know, from the very beginning, their B-sides were, you know, were great. And so they kind of taught us to, you know, because, you know, up until then, you know, it was kind of like, you know, B-sides were just uh, meant to be, you know, a piece of junk, you know, like the way Phil Spector handled B-sides, where he would just have a jam from the Wrecking Crew and then put that out on a B-side of a Crystals record with the Crystals name on it, even though nobody's even singing on the record. Mm. But, But the Beatles, because they wanted to give, you know, quality, you know, with really everything everything they released, they had very good B-sides. Right. And so that taught us to kind of pay attention even with other groups. So there were a lot of other, uh, and, oh, and the Beach Boys were doing the same thing, I should say, at that, at that same time. And so there were some Dave Clark Five B-sides that, you know, that I never would have heard otherwise, never would have discovered that were great songs. Hmm. And, you know, speaking, of, speaking of Dave Clark Five, boy, Mike Smith really should have gotten a lot more attention than he did back then. And it's too bad that when he finally started to get attention that what happened to him happened. Yeah. And, uh, it's just yeah. it's just so tragic. Yeah, you know, because the, you know, really the... You know, most of the promotion behind the Dave Clark Five really just centered on Dave. You know, mm-hmm. because of the fact that he was the best-looking member of the group, which and, he really wasn't. <laughs> yeah, Please. and and you know, and you know, and and it didn't help the fact that again, they didn't have any personalities. Right. You know, it, it was really obvious in having a wild weekend too. I mean, yeah. that should have been a halfway decent movie. Yeah. All things exactly. considered, because of uh, John Borman's direction and and mm-hmm. everything, and it really isn't, and it's just it's just a shame. Yeah, much uh, much the same with uh, Ferry Cross the Mercy. You know, now Ferry Cross the Mercy actually is, I think, is better than it's, having it's a better, weekend. but again, you know, I mean, you know, you don't, you're not really getting much in the way of personality. No, you're you're right. You're right. Where and this again, you know, because hey, that, that, that's one of the secrets. Uh, behind the success of A Hard Day's Night, mm-hmm. where, you know, each member of the group now, you know, we, we know now that, you know, that, that there had been a solo scene that Paul uh, was filmed in. That, you know, it's, <laughs> Paul's just not a very good actor. Right. But, but still, 
they were able to kind of flesh out their their personalities in a hard day's night in a way that they really weren't able to do in any of the other uh, films of any of the other British British bands. Right. Well, that's that's another thing is that there was a very, I think, uh, concerted effort on the part of the Beatles for each of the four of them to establish personalities and to get time. Yes. And it's not just in their films. It's in their press conferences. They always tried to make mm-hmm. sure that, that George would get a question and Ringo would get a question. It wouldn't just be John and Paul all the time. Right. And it, that's the same way in the movies, too. Yeah. I thought it was actually brilliant. It was actually brilliant in a way that, considering the fact that John and Paul wrote most of their music, and George, of course, not nearly as much as John and Paul, but um, Ringo got more time in A Hard Day's Night in Help, so more attention was given to him to make up for that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and I, you know, um, I have a feeling that, uh, that, you know, that at least in part, uh, the popularity that, um, that he, you know, received well, during that first visit to America, even though the movie had basically been written already, um, I think what happened was that the you know the popularity that he had earned both in England but especially here in America during that first visit, I think that um, uh, that probably contributed to uh, how big a role uh, Ringo was given in the film. Mm-hmm. That actually, so much of the film really does revolve around Ringo. Right. Yeah. So Al, and it's and it's funny how that tide has kind of been reversed now and um, he's had to weather a lot of negative publicity, you know, because of the autograph thing and stuff. When in fact he's still basically the same guy. Um, yeah. yeah, pretty much. But but also there's the fact that, you know, that Paul obviously has a much higher profile. He plays stadiums. Um, he plays three-hour shows. Whereas Ringo plays smaller venues, he does, right. you know, he, and by his own choice, he uses the all-star band, and so, and he's really, you know, just kind of the band leader, but he doesn't do the whole show on his own. Right. So obviously, he has a much, uh, you know, a much smaller profile. Paul's fans are just, are dedicated, as, as, I mean, incredibly dedicated. Oh God! Um, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, they really, they really are. So, uh, uh, I and I and probably had you know had John or or George if John, John or George were was still alive, they would have the same kind of adoration you know to them. Oh but, yeah, but they have, really, but they, they but they don't, but they don't. Yeah. And like you say, Ringo keeps a, small, a lower profile. Yeah. And, I mean, you know, from the very beginning, there were, you know, I mean, there's a whole, uh, you know, phalanx of uh, what they call, you know, they call themselves John Girls, who, uh, you know, are extremely, you know, uh, still, you know, extremely loyal to him. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and there's also a whole army of George fans. So that's, you know, that's kind of uh, what I was getting at, that, you know, that each of the four... Uh, from the very beginning, um, had very dedicated uh, fan bases uh, of their, you know, of their own. Mm-hmm. And that was a very yeah. big part of their appeal. You know, you, everybody can find one Beatle that they can identify with more than the exactly. others. Exactly. So, so how much of the Beatles' success, Al, would you attribute to timing at all? I. Timing wise, I really the talent was there. It's obvious, but yeah. you know the uh, you know time. I you know I I I don't really put much uh, timing wise. I I just don't think there's uh, you know that much to it. You know the uh, you know the, as I said the you know the Kennedy angle. I just don't buy that at all because too much time. You know I mean especially I don't know if it's the same now. But certainly in those days, unless there was a death in one's family or some personal trauma, teenagers in that in that era bounced back a lot quicker. So yes, President Kennedy was absolutely a hero uh, 
to teenagers and to, and to young people in general. And it was a terrible psychic body blow. But within a couple of weeks of the, after the assassination, by, say, the second week in December, we had really, you know, kind of moved on and were, you know, back to our, our normal routines. And, um, you know, I was probably more concerned with, uh, you know, whether the, uh, whether the football giants were going to win the, the, you know, the National Football League's Eastern, Eastern Conference Championship uh, than any uh, lasting depression over the, the loss of President Kennedy. Again, and without minimizing how terrible that was. I mean, there are, you know, there are homes in this country, in Ireland, and in places around the world where they, you can still find prominently displayed either a, a portrait or a photograph of President Kennedy. Mm. Mm-hmm. So it was it was a terrible loss, but you know within you know a couple of weeks you know you know people just went on with their lives and certainly that was the case with teenagers. So by the time I want to hold your hand really took off when it took off in New York particularly in the first week in January, you, you know there had been there was already a fair amount of time separation between there and the end of November. So I don't, you know, so I don't buy that, you know, the the Kennedy angle uh, at all. Uh, again, that was really just, um, you know, a device that was, uh, you know, the, uh, the 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 mainstream media. Again, almost all male, almost all middle aged people that, by and large, hated rock and roll. Uh, they had to come up with a reason why. Suddenly, thousands of kids showed up at Kennedy Airport on February 7th to see the Beatles' arrival, and why two nights later, their first appearance on the Ed Sullivan Show got double the normal, the normal high rating that the Ed Sullivan Show normally got. They doubled that, and mm-hmm. they doubled it again the following week. Right. And and this was and this was in a country that uh, at that point had about 194 million people, and an estimated 73 million of them watched the Ed Sullivan Show uh, on February 9th, and uh, just a little bit less than that the following week. So so they had to explain. So the media had to explain why this was happening. And there were, you know, there were some psychological, you know, uh, angles, like the recently departed Dr. Joyce Brothers did one of those. But by and large, they had to try to explain this. And again, you know, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't the music, because that was just rotten rock and roll. And it wasn't them, because they're, they're just guys with long hair. Um, so they had to come up with a reason, and the reason they came up with was that the, the teenagers were so heartbroken and so depressed by the assassination of President Kennedy that the Beatles gave them something to laugh at, as if they were comedians, and that the haircuts were part of the act. Hmm. You know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Anything to minimize the music. Yeah, exactly. It's, you know, it's not, you know, it had nothing to do with the music, it had nothing to do with them. It was just um, depression. But also you got to realize, and we, we bring this up several times here on this show, mm-hmm. I think a lot of people thought that you know the average lifespan of a rock and roller was a couple of years, and even the Beatles thought that way back then. Sure. So the credibility of rock and roll was not <laughs> at an all-time high back then. It was still in its oh, infancy. Oh, no, not at all. Not at all. It was, you know, in fact, in the, um, I mean, in the New York Times, when uh, whenever they had... Um, um, articles about music it was classical music and there usually if there was anything about um, anything connected with rock and roll it was just called pop or you know something you know something else pop or folk Mm -hmm. you know whatever it wasn't considered to be as rock and roll especially was not considered to be music you know music was Music was classical music or perhaps jazz. Right. But, 
but and that's uh, that's reflected a lot in the the TV programs of the '60s. <laughs> mm-hmm. All the sitcoms, how they really cut down rock and roll, oh, and yeah. make it seem like you know it's it's the fad for its time, and it's it's what oh, those yeah. kids like, you know. Sure, uh, I can remember. Uh, you guys probably remember a uh, Borscht Belt comedian named Jack Carter. Mm-hmm. Oh yes, he used to frequently appear on the Ed Sullivan Show, and he would um, he would occasionally do like you know an imitation of a rock and roll singer, and he would have like his eyes crossed and his mouth all slack and just you know going <laughs> you know that kind of thing. And oh yeah, rock and roll had very little credibility in the in the adult world in the, at that time right you know that's why i've always um uh, i've always had this kind of the, this sort of fantasy of a um of a you know a, you know some guy sitting in a in a dentist's office or a restaurant or something where they would have uh you know the local beautiful music station playing you know on the the sound system and um You'd hear, say, a, you know, uh, the Hollywood Strings, say, doing, um, doing all my loving. Right. And oh yes. <laughs> the DJ, the DJ would come out of that, or the the personality on, you know, whatever the beautiful music WPAT or whatever the, you know, the beautiful music station of the moment was, would come out uh, and say something about, you know, in identifying the songs. And say, and you know, the, the Hollywood Strings with, uh, you know, All My Loving, which was this, you know, recent hit by, by the Beatles, which was written by their, you know, their members, John Lennon and Paul McCartney. And I can kind of, like I said, in this fantasy, I can kind of see this, this Don Draper type sitting in, you know, in a, you know, as I said, in a dentist office or a restaurant, you know, kind of reacting like, the Beatles wrote that? Gee, that's not bad. You know? Right. Right. And there probably was some of that. Hmm. You know, although there was the opposite. I, I can remember Ella Fitzgerald appearing on William B. Williams' show on the old WNAW AM in New York. And this was at the time, this was after she had recorded, um, done her cover of Can't Buy Me Love, which George Martin produced. And she was trying to tell William B. that the Beatles were actually very good. And he, he had been one of their most vocal opponents. Really? And he absolutely, he absolutely would not change his opinion. You know, to him, they were just talentless rock and rollers. You know, so even like, you know, the first lady of American song couldn't convince him that, that, they, were, that they were worthwhile. Right. When you had early pretty examples, astound, pretty astounding. Yeah, when you had early examples of people like Leonard Bernstein praising yeah. them, you would think yeah. that the older generation would stand up and take notice. You know, respect someone of that stature, Leonard Bernstein. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Ber- but Bernstein didn't happen until later, though, did he? Or yeah, I was going to say that. Yeah, it was. It was. It was. Uh, you know, a, a while later, but there were uh, sort of serious music students. Who actually did did say from the very beginning that they were you know that they that they had great melodies and that they they actually did write very good music. Mm-hmm. But it took um, it took a while for you know for the adult world to kind of catch on to that. I guess probably yesterday is the you know kind of the turning point of that. Mm. Yeah. Do Do you remember you remember watching them on television now? Oh oh absolutely. <laughs> Uh, oh, absolutely! Uh, no you have any memory. have any memories from that? I, I have well, my own memories. Well, the funny thing is, is that I actually was was a holdout. I, you know, I thought that this was all a lot of hype. You know, that suddenly all these girls were going crazy over this group that they had, hadn't heard of two weeks before. Mm-hmm. And so I I kind of took the attitude of, okay, show me how good you are. <laughs> and so, and the first, the first Sullivan show actually didn't do it for me. Really, wow. the one that did it was the second show, the one from Miami Beach. Wow! And it wasn't until years later that I realized why. It was because the show was done uh, in a, you know, in a ballroom, 
in, right. the Deauville, in the Deauville Hotel on this rather small stage, because if, if, if you've you know, watched the DVD, notice how close the three of them are to each other. Right. And, and they were only a few months removed from playing ballrooms like that in England. Mm-hmm. So they were still, so they were kind of in their element, plus the fact that the sound mix was, um, you know, <laughs> there was no sound mix in effect. And right. so there was the bass and the drums that were very uh, predominant. Um, and, and hey, I mean, that's the, that was the, you know, the best rhythm section in rock and roll. And right. that was, and that was what, you know, kind of got to me. And it was uh, that was the show that probably made me a Beatles fan. Wow! Wow! Well, actually, the first person I've ever heard that did didn't say the first show did it for him. Uh, Yeah, uh, I know, I know. There's like a whole uh, you know a whole generation of uh, you know Bruce Springsteens and Billy Joels and Tom Petty's and Steve Van Zants, et cetera, et cetera, who Mm -hmm. you know whose lives were changed on that first show. Oh, I remember, I remember that, and I remember. Being excited, you know, uh, watching what was going on, and and just you know going, wow, this is great. I mean, I actually have to. My sister had actually kind of discovered them a little bit before I did, and it wasn't until um, somebody in my classroom had said uh, they, they our class had been split up into two groups, and the other group called themselves the Beatles. And I said to my best friend who was in the other group, I said, "What's with the Beatles?" And he said. You've never heard of them, mm-hmm. <laughs> and and it and and then shortly thereafter, I got uh, inducted, and, and the, the rest is history. But uh, but yeah, I mean, it was it was it was uh, that's the way it was. It was, uh, but I I do remember in, very much enjoying that first show, and and by that point, we had my mother had taken us down to the local department store, and and she had, my sister had picked up the album Meet the Beatles in mono mm-hmm. and I had picked up the singles with the pi- with the picture covers which unfortunately I had, are long gone um, but in any event that's that's what happened okay we really have to wrap things up so Al you, it's been great having you on the show and uh, again the book is called Changing Times 101 Days That Shaped a Generation you're welcome to come back anytime thank it's, you very much Ken I appreciate it and thanks very much Steve you're welcome, Al. All right. So, for things we said today, this is Ken Michaels thanking everyone for listening and thanking Al Sussman for joining us. And I'll see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci saying real quick, we'll see you next time. <laughs>